Line Y1, learning task four, we're gonna take a look at wound rotor motor construction. Uh, and this is gonna be a specific type of three-phase motor. Now, like all three-phase motors, it is going to go and follow that same format that we've talked about right from the very beginning, which is that it is going to go and take power in. That power is then going to go through some sort of a transformation from my main stator windings. Those stator windings are gonna create magnetic flux. That magnetic flux is then going to go and cut across another set of windings that is going to go and be inside of my rotor itself. On a regular squirrel cage motor, what we do is we just short circuit. We, we put a bar right across the ends of these uh, rotor windings, and then that just allows unrestricted current to go and flow through those windings, which allows us to go and develop motor torque off of that. That whole idea of us having circulating currents that are going to be grabbed by the magnetic fields and hurled around in a circle. What we have on a wound rotor motor is going to be different. We are going to go and have these that we are going to need to take back out of the motor. We're going to leave them open, the windings, and then we're going to be able to go and place resistances across them, or we are going to be able to go and short across those windings so that we can have either unrestricted current if I would go and short across the windings like that, or I can have restricted current if I go and have the contacts open and only the path of resistance going through there. So it's a specialized type of construction. Referring back to what we've covered in the first three learning tasks, we know that when we have got a high resistance type of rotor, that we are going to go and have extremely high torque characteristics. And now not only are we gonna have a high resistance type of rotor, we're gonna have a high resistance type of rotor that we're gonna be able to go and adjust values of resistance. We'll see how we do that in upcoming ones, but this is the long and short of how these things are going to go and operate. Let's talk about the, <coughs> excuse me, the components of these motors. Let's start with this section over here, which is going to go and be our stator. Our stator is going to be the same as for any other three-phase type of motor, meaning that it's going to go and have multiple windings. The windings can be single or dual voltage, and they can be connected into either Y or delta. The point of the stator windings is ultimately to go and create that rotating magnetic field that's going to be traveling at our synchronous speed. Synchronous. That's all that we require from these stators and we treat them the exact same as we would on any other type of three phase motor. What we have then on our rotor is gonna be a little bit different. Our rotor is not gonna be made out of that squirrel cage that we saw before where we have got circles and bars and we're shorted out like that. What we actually do is we remove the shorting inside of one end and then what we do is we also go and have just multiple windings, multiple wraps. So I'm just gonna draw you know, a multiple wrap over here and then we take those leads out of the motor. And the way that we take them out of the motor is we are going to take them out on slip rings. Slip rings are going to be solid circular rings that are gonna be mounted around the shaft of the motor. So here's my shaft and keyway right over there. Uh, we have this insulating material that's gonna be between the shaft and the slip ring. And then around the outside of that insulating material, we're just gonna go and have a brass or a copper ring. And then all we need to do to take power out of that circuit is we have to go and have a brush that's gonna go and ride up against it. It is a continuous circle, which means that it is always going to be making contact. It's not a commutator, it's not doing any switching, it's just carrying power directly out. We refer to this rotor as being the secondary circuit of the motor because we are still gonna go through on that whole transformation idea. This is gonna be a primary. We are going to go and supply power into here. The power is going to go and create a magnetic field. That magnetic field cuts across the secondary winding. And then the secondary is going to go and create a value of voltage. We carry that voltage out onto the slip rings and then we're going to go and feed that voltage through to some sort of a resistor grid that we're gonna have on the outside of it. Slip rings are gonna be uh, solid brass. They're gonna be a fairly hard type of brass. They're gonna be conductive, but we don't want them to be too soft that they're gonna wear down for operation because we're gonna have the brushes themselves that are gonna be riding up against it continuously. The brushes themselves are gonna be made up of a softer material. They're designed to be the sacrificial one that wears down during the operation. Uh, it's gonna be things like our carbon, our graphites, uh, silver graphites, stuff that is going to be electrically conductive and also lubricating. That's why we once again have graphite that is so prevalent in all of our brushes. They give us a picture of a brush holder over here and a brush holder just shows that uh, we would go and have the actual rotor sorry, not the rotor, but the actual slip ring would be riding underneath here. This spring that we see over here goes all the way through into the other side and it provides a downward force. So it's consistently pushing up against here. 
The brush holder itself is going to be metal. The brush itself is going to go and be carbon. And then we're going to go and have a flexible lead, the pigtail or the shunt that comes off the back of the brush that goes all the way up to this section to make contact with this. This whole brush holder arm is going to go and get energized. We bring power in. It's going to be mounted on an insulating block. We bring power into that and we liven up the entire thing so that it can carry power through the brush and then back to the actual slip ring that it's going to be riding on. End bells and bearings are going to be pretty much the same. Usually there's going to be more accessibility on the uh, end bells of these in a lot of our three-phase motors, standard uh, squirrel cage induction motors. We don't need to ever access the rotor itself. You know, it's a sealed circuit, uh, which means that we don't need to, you know, open and close this thing. This, we do have brushes that do need to be maintained. As you can see up top here, we've got a couple of things. Uh, the brushes themselves will need to be replaced. As I lose brush pressure, as this brush itself wears down, what I have to do is I have to move that spring and I have to cam it underneath different ones of these to go and provide you know additional amounts of torque to make up for the length that has been lost off of that brush. So as a result, our end bells on these things in a lot of cases are going to go and have access plates where I'm going to be able to get into that thing to go and make uh, any adjustments that need to be clean, etc. Name plate on these is also going to be a little bit different. Uh, the name plate uh, is going to go and include a second set of ratings that are going to go and be for my secondary circuit. Uh, my secondary circuit is going to be the rotor. So what I'm going to often see on my name plate is they're either going to go and call it, you know, the secondary current that it's going to have for ratings, or it is going to be the rotor current that is going to be rated on there. Same with we are going to have secondary voltage or rotor voltage. Both of these mean the exact same thing, whether we call it the secondary or whether we call it the rotor, we are going to see these as being identical. We do want to go and uh, take a look though at this term secondary because secondary does show up in another place outside of this module. And that place is going to be our Canadian electrical code. Let's go there. You should be pretty familiar with section 28 of the Canadian electrical code. If you have not been familiar with it, don't worry, you're gonna get quite familiar with it as we go through all of the motors and gensets. Inside of section 28, we do have a bunch of information about how we're to do our connections, you know, etc. wiring methods. Uh, we start going down into motor supply conductor insulation uh, temperatures, where we're going to have to go and take a look at whether something is going to be, you know, A, B, F, etc. Uh, then it's going to talk about the insulated conductors that are feeding. Uh, so it says supplying a motor. So that's going to be anything that is going to be feeding into the motor, whether it's going to be a regular squirrel cage induction, wound rotor, or synchronous that we're going to discover later on. Then they talk about, you know, when I'm using conductors to go and feed groups of motors, supplying a group of two or more motors, etc. And then at the very bottom of that first section over there, 28 buck 12 over here, it talks about secondary insulated conductors. Secondary insulated conductors are going to go and be the ones that come from the rotors of our wound rotor motors. And they say that specifically inside here. Insulated conductors connecting the secondaries of a wound rotor motors to their controller shall have an impasse not less than... 125% of the rated full load secondary current. This is why we need to have that secondary current rating available for us on our nameplates. And then it says, ampacities of insulated conductors connecting secondary resistors to the controllers, we're gonna learn how that happens later on, shall not be less than that determined by applying the appropriate percentage in table 28 to their maximum current that the devices are required to go and carry. So we're going to just go over to cable 28 and it just gives us a determining conductor sizes in the secondary circuits of motors. Uh, secondary circuits is going to be once again wound rotor motors that we would be talking about and it's just going to talk about how many times I'm going to go and start it uh, and stop it. If it's continuous duty then you know I'm going to start the thing up once and it just kind of runs so the chances are I'm not going to go and overheat those but if I'm going to be doing um, extra heavy starting duty, you know, where it's 15 seconds on, 75 seconds off, or, you know, 15 seconds on and uh, 30 seconds off, etc. I'm going to go and have different current carrying capacity that I'm going to go and have to have for these because I'm starting and stopping these things much more, uh, more often off of these. Anyways, we'll cover all of that code stuff later on. Just know that uh, we are not always going to go and refer to the rotor circuit when we are dealing with these things in code. In code, we are going to go into call this circuit over here our secondary circuit, uh, secondary motor circuit. All right, that's it for the intro. The next one is going to go into the operation, and that is far more complex than what this 10-minute intro would go and give us uh, cause to believe.